like that. That's one of the complications. You have to know all the <laughs> right <laughs> buttons to push, and if you push the wrong ones, there are consequences. By the way, does that metaphor apply to people as well? <laughs> you push <laughs> the wrong buttons and you uh, suffer uh, consequences. Okay, anyway, we appear to be uh, streaming. Welcome to you all, and uh, I'll see. It's okay. <laughs> it, it says it's running here. So it's either, it's either stream, he says it's streaming here. So I, th I think, uh, as I said, um, we're, we've had problems every time we've streamed before. So my new, what we're going to do newly now is I don't want to be distracted by all this stuff during our satsang. So if it streams, fine. If there's any problem with the stream, then the recording will be published instead later. So let it, l we'll just let it be. But I do want to welcome all, anyone who is online, a special welcome to you. And of course, after it's published, many more will be attending this uh, satsang. Okay. Um, as always, we'll take uh, questions both from our local New Jersey students and from our online students. Many have come on email. I want to apologize in advance if I don't answer your emailed <coughs> question. There are many more questions than we're able to answer. We'll do the, the best we can. And let me start with a question, actually not from an email, but a comment. Um, you probably know that I don't respond to any comments on the YouTube channel. There are thousands and thousands, so it's not reasonable. But I do read every single one of them, and some of them strike me, and, and I'd like to share with you one of those comments. Um, the question is, I had said that every mantra is in some way a prayer. All mantras are prayers, which is true from a traditional standpoint. On or in some way that mantra leads to a connection with, with Ishvara, with the divinity. And the question is, is that true for transcendental meditation? The questioner, I think, is trained in transcendental meditation, follower of that particular system of meditation. The questioner says, because it was my understanding that this mantra, the mantra given in TM, the TM mantra was supposed to have no connection to words, religions, or otherwise, which is absolutely true for transcendental meditation. So Mahesh Yogi, many of you may already know this, Mahesh Yogi was an innovator. He took the traditional Hindu practice of mantra japa and he changed it for modern consumption, so to speak. And one of the ways he did that is, he, he interesting background, by the way, the backstory. His, the f when he started out in the, uh, mostly in the early 1960s, the mantra he gave everyone was Ram, 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 Ram. And his European students, he had a lot of students in Europe in those days, his European students says, who is Ram? He didn't want to, <laughs> he didn't want to go there. He wanted to remove the Hindu dressings from the practice of mantra japa. So as a result, he later abandoned the use of Ram, and then he introduced a bunch of mantras that he just made up. He admits he made them up, and in his own words, I'm not, not being critical, these are his own words, these are meaningless syllables. So he gave to his followers meaningless syllables to recite uh, for, as a mantra, and um, he did so because he wanted to remove the, any kind of religiosity from this tradition. So you can think of TM as a secular form of mantra japa. Does it work? Why not? But tell me, when you give up that prayerful dimension of a mantra, 
Aren't you losing out on something? If you had a choice between reciting a meaningless syllable and reciting an ancient prayer, which has been recited by great saints and sages for millennia, which would you choose? I, to, to me, you know, it's easy to understand why Mahesh Yogi did what he did, but I think there was a, a huge compromise made in that process. And with regard to the, uh, the, the questioner here, who is Ayush, who lives in India, Ayush, you've been trained in this TM tradition, and the TM tradition is not a, tr is not, we call it tradition, but it's not traditional. That is, it doesn't go back to the ancient sages. This has been revised extensively by <coughs> Mahesh Yogi. So his mantras, in his own words, are meaningless syllables, but traditional mantras are prayers. Okay, that's... Uh, well, actually, Ayush in India is the first questioner here, not, not the uh, commenter. The first questioner, first question for today, comes from Ayush, who lives in India, and he asks, Although I am able to grasp the teachings of Advaita Vedanta with good clarity, I still can't resist my anger, greed, material desires, and fear. What should I do? And allow me to be a little bit sarcastic. What you should do is stop grasping the teachings of Vedanta. <laughs> You've, you may have heard me say, kind of, again, sarcastically, if you are studying Vedanta, you are wasting your time. And I'm, I don't mean that facetiously. If you are studying Vedanta, you're wasting your time. It becomes an academic pursuit, or in modern times, it becomes an intellectual hobby for many, many people. Waste of time. Vedanta is a solution to the problem of suffering. The problem <coughs> of suffering is the essence is focused on who you are. So if you're studying Vedanta, your attention is focused in the wrong direction. Instead of focusing on teachings, you should be focusing on yourself. And this is such a common problem. It's not just for Ayush. It's for a great many students of Advaita Vedanta. We are so conditioned to study like we did back in our <coughs> school days and college days. That kind of study, if you bring that kind of study to, your, to Vedanta, you ruin the teachings of Vedanta. Vedanta... We use the term study, but it's misleading. Better to use the term self-inquiry, atma vichara. That's actually much, much more accurate. Yes, we, we use casually the expression, we study Vedanta. But when you study Vedanta, what does that mean? As I said, if you're just studying teachings and books, you're wasting your time. But if you're using those teachings to Guide a process of self-inquiry. That's Vedanta. That's what we're after. And for Ayush and everyone like him, when you shift from, a more, from this academic study perspective and you shift instead to self-inquiry, you'll find that your problems like, what, is, what do you say? anger, greed, material desires, and fear, those problems get addressed through self-inquiry, not through this conceptual study of Advaita Vedanta. In India, there are, many, there are many colleges and universities where Vedanta is a subject matter, so you'll have a professor of Vedanta. Is teaching you, you Vedanta. Tell me, do you think you're, you're, that Vedanta professor is free from anger, greed, material <laughs> desires, <laughs> and fear? Not likely. You get my point, is it's an academic study and not a process of self-inquiry. Okay, next question. And then we'll take some questions from here. This is a question from Himesh, who lives uh, near, near Washington, D.C. He says, Many times, 
I've said that meditation alone is not sufficient for enlightenment, but without, in, without meditation, you won't get enlightened. So this in philosophical terms, meditation is necessary but insufficient. Without meditation, you won't get enlightened, but by meditation alone, you won't get enlightened. Necessary but insufficient. And now his question comes, Himesh, he asks, what if a person, instead of meditation, does karma yoga and bhakti? Can that person gain enlightenment without meditation? So you replace meditation with karma yoga and bhakti. Well, in fact, all three of them are <laughs> necessary but insufficient. Meditation is necessary, insufficient. Devotional practices, necessary, insufficient. Karma yoga, necessary plus insufficient. The metaphor given again and again in uh, classical texts and mostly in commentaries to explain this necessary but insufficient is if you're going to cook rice, what cooks is fire. So fire is the direct means. The direct means for enlightenment, Shankara says clearly, jnanam eva moksha. The direct means for enlightenment is knowledge. And not just any kind of knowledge, the particular kind of knowledge that removes the so-called veil of ignorance that prevents you from discovering your true divine nature, Satchitananda, Atma. But just like Fire alone isn't enough to cook rice. In the same way, knowledge alone won't work in Vedanta because there are other secondary factors which are required. They're not the direct factors, but they're secondary factors which are crucial. If you want to cook rice, you have fire. If you don't have a pot, if you don't have water, if you don't have some kind of spoon, now, notice the water pot and spoon don't cook, but without those, you can't cook rice. In the same way, meditation, bhakti, and karma yoga are like the <coughs> pot, spoon, and water. Necessary, but insufficient. And not just those three. <laughs> There's a lot required in order for this Vedantic knowledge to be effective and really lead you to discover your true nature as such at Ananda Atma is a tremendous level of preparation required. And without that preparation, nothing happens. Since we're using the uh, cooking example, think of it, many of you cook meals regularly. Tell me, what takes more time, cooking the vegetables or preparing them? Isn't that an interesting thing? Mm -hmm. You spend more time chopping and cleaning and doing this and the other thing. You know, there's more goes into the preparation. And even before the cooking, I've watched some of you cook. You, you, put these, you put a little oil in the pan and you put some spices in there and they go pop, 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 pop and all of this stuff. You know, that's not cooking, right? That's preparation. <laughs> but that preparation is crucial. So in the kitchen, there more effort goes into preparation than cooking. In Advaita Vedanta, more effort goes into preparation than gaining self-knowledge. Gaining self-knowledge is a goal, but the effort required for... When you... Huh, just one last comment here. When you are fully prepared through meditation, karma yoga, bhakti, then you stand on the precipice of enlightenment, which comes effortlessly. The effort is required for the preparation, not for enlightenment. Okay, do we have some questions uh, here, locally? A question here, please. Swamiji, we've understood Vedanta from 
distinguishing the knower and the known um, so that it points to Atma. Now, what we understood from today's class uh, is that it looks like knowing also is some form of action, like there is something involved in knowing itself. Um, so I'm starting to wonder if, um, how can I interpret Atma in that case? Um, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Are you saying knowing to know Atma is an action? Um, knowing itself, the, the act of knowing, it seems like knowing is... Um, I to know my presence here on the chair, there is effort involved to turn your head in my direction. There might be some effort involved to keep your eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get a little drowsy after a while. Um, there's effort involved with that. But when your eyes are open and you're looking at me, what effort is required to see me? What action is required? There's no action, there's no effort. Knowledge just takes place effortlessly without action, when all the everything, when all the conditions are satisfied. When all the conditions are satisfied, knowledge takes place. Like the, the metaphor I just said, when you are completely prepared through meditation, bhakti, and karma yoga, you are, figuratively speaking, standing on the precipice of enlightenment, and all you need is a little push. A little push is tattvamasi, and it's effortlessly. Of course, falling over a cliff is not a great <laughs> metaphor <laughs> for enlightenment, but you get the idea, you fall effortlessly is the point of that metaphor. Knowledge is effortless. Preparation for gaining that knowledge may take a lot of effort. Any follow-up on that? Yeah, uh, how can we understand this um, from our meditation, for example, because if anything that appears in meditation is an object, so, and then we kind of switch to, to whom is this being revealed? And more or less, it kind of gets stuck at the level of the mind in saying that uh, knowing an object, you know, an okay. object level knowledge seems to be the work of the mind, yeah. So thinking, I have lost my stuff here. Mm. Okay. <coughs> thinking is an effort, an activity. Thinking and knowing are not the same, right? <laughs> thinking is one of the pr steps of preparation, analysis, logic, reasoning. All of these are steps of preparation. Knowledge is not an action. Knowledge takes place effortlessly and instantly and spontaneously when all the conditions are met. So mental activities require effort, but mental activities are not knowledge. They're a means of knowledge. They can lead you to knowledge. Does that work for you? Okay. Another question here in the hall, in back? There are two questions. Manish first. The question is about karma. So we get the results of our karmas. Good karma gets us the good results and the bad karma, bad results. But that sort of implies the morality attached to good and bad. And I'm sure that over the ages, the morality changes, right? If whatever was moral 400 years ago, it is no longer there or maybe vice versa. Correct. Where does the good and the bad as far as how, how do you judge good versus bad when this was whole written versus now? Good. Shall we substitute the words dharma and adharma for good and bad? Because the English word good means what you like, <laughs> and the English word bad means what you don't like. If I ask you, is uh, Karela good or bad, <laughs> is bitter gourd, and good or bad is a matter of personal judgment. 
So let's set those words good and bad aside and instead use pro the proper language, dharma and adharma. For your dharmic actions, you, can, you get good karma. For your adharmic actions, you suffer the consequences of so-called uh, bad karma means undesirable results. You know, those, these words, good and bad, unfortunately, are deeply embedded in English language, so it's a little hard to get rid of them. And dharma and adharma we define very clearly. Dharma is what causes growth for a person. Adharma is what causes injury. Not just to a person, but just in general. Adharma is, we define it as himsa, that which is harmful. And it could be that what was harmful in ancient days and what's harmful in modern days could change, and that's, that's possible. But if we define it in terms of harm, then we have no problem. So dharma, let me, instead of saying growth, let me say beneficial. That which is beneficial is dharma, that which is unbeneficial or harmful is adharma and here we have a universal definition that is not based on culture not based on a list of commandments found in a scripture i think the uh, the hindu concept of of dharma is unique unparalleled and just brilliant do you have a follow-up on that okay one more question right next mm -hmm. namaste swamiji so my question is about uh, Anugraha. Uh, so all the gurus and spiritual traditions that I've listened to says that, uh, as you mentioned just uh, to the uh, like questions from the uh, online participant, uh, is uh, uh, Karma Yuga and Bhakti in itself are not sufficient. So even Jnana is not sufficient if there is uh, no Anugraha from the Ishwara. We won't call it insufficient it doesn't work insufficient yeah. is it not the right yeah, word to use work. here it doesn't work so uh, for example avatuta tatatreya or even shankaracharya himself and the uh, lord krishna in bhagavad gita they're saying that uh, like the final final oh. is the grace yeah. anugraha got it uh, our efforts in itself are not insufficient to yeah. achieve enlightenment or I, li I like the question good thank you so this doctrine of anugraha you get enlightened through blessings. And without blessings, no one gets enlightened. This almost sounds to me like a Protestant version. Because it sounds, I can almost hear Martin Luther saying, through faith alone and God's blessings alone, you get, you get salvation saved from eternal hell. And I think like Martin Luther was a reformer and had his own thing going. I think this doctrine of grace alone is similarly a revisionist interpretation of traditional teachings. Because the revisionists want to say grace alone. That's what they say. Through God's grace alone. By the way, I, if I'm not, I'm not an expert in Vishishta Dvaita and Dvaita, but I'm pretty sure many of those teachers have those very doctrines through grace through god's grace alone you are you you gain mukti moksha uh, liberation the reason traditional advaita vedanta rejects this teaching of grace alone with grace is one of those necessary but insufficient measures in other words you need grace <laughs> You need grace to wake up in the morning. <laughs> you need God's grace to do anything. In fact, properly understood, everything is God's grace. Without God's grace, we wouldn't wake up in the morning. Without grace, our hearts wouldn't go on beating. Without grace, our minds won't think. So we could say then that grace is absolutely required. We accept that. But the doctrine is grace alone. And that's absolutely rejected. So we would say it is one of the many necessary but insufficient factors required to be ready 
to gain this knowledge, the knowledge which results in enlightenment. Any follow-up? Yes, uh, my intention was that uh, I agree totally that uh, grace is uh, necessary for everything. Yeah, so my question was more like, if you do everything that is required, you do bhakti, you do karma yoga, you do like, um, I mean, self-inquiry, everything. So uh, at the like final stage when you are prepared for, for everything, so that's when this final grace uh, intervenes. Kind yeah, of. That's again grace alone. You're, yeah. you're, it's the same. Like you're, you're restating the same doctrine. Let's go back to our earlier metaphor about seeing me. Your head is facing me. Your eyes are open. Everything is ready. But if there's no grace, you won't see me. Does that make any sense? Yeah, there was grace all the way. <laughs> so grace is always there. But it's not like you're waiting for grace. As soon as the grace comes, you'll see me. And that doesn't, that doesn't work. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Thank Let's you. take a few questions online, and then we'll come back to take uh, questions from our local students. This is a question from Jay, who lives in New York. He says, I li the interesting question, it shows how logic, we can use logic to dig a hole <laughs> and get lost <laughs> in that hole. And I'm not being critical of Jay, but it just shows how uh, we say logic cuts both ways. It can be helpful and it can be confusing. So here Jay says, if we have lived an infinite number of prior lives, which is exactly what the doctrine of karma says, you didn't have a first birth, you have had an infinite number of prior lives, which is what Jay understands properly, then if that's so, shouldn't we have reached enlightenment already? That's interesting. <laughs> in, <laughs> in an infinite number of prior lives, you should have reached by now. <laughs> you should have reached enlightenment. Well, this is a... He's, you know, from the standpoint of pure logic, he's making a perfectly good point. But from the standpoint of human experience, it's not meaningful. The fact is, we're sitting here today. <laughs> it's an undeniable fact. Also, according to these teachings, if you did gain enlightenment in any one of those prior births, you wouldn't be sitting here today. <laughs> because you would not have been reborn. Um, I guess the, the deeper point here is Jay is making a, a logical point. And in Advaita Vedanta, we make a distinction between Shushka Tarka and Shruti Anugraha Tarka. And these are complicated expressions. I'm, I'm sorry, but let me explain them. Shushka tarka literally means dry logic. And it means what, you know, whatever, whatever logic you are able to manage. Logic is a tool, and sometimes those tools can be very powerful. And Jay's use of logic here is powerful. I won't deny that. But that logic that, that's being used here is not shruti. Actually, I used the wrong ex expression. Shruti anukula tarka. I used the word anugraha wrongly, uh, shuti anukula tarka, which means reasoning that is in conformance with this tradition of Advaita Vedanta. Logic that was used by the ancient rishis and the whole lineage of teachers up to modern times, lo logic which is helpful to gain Moksha. Let, let's be very clear about one thing. Um, this isn't meant to be critical, but most schools of, lo of Buddhism, having rejected Shruti, scripture, they rely heavily on logic. And <laughs> we all appreciate the power and value of logic, reasoning. But we also recognize the limitations of that logic 
and reasoning and to imagine through sheer brain power you're going to be enlightened is not a reasonable assumption. So we use logic but in its place. We use it as a tool. We use it where it's helpful and where it's not helpful we set it aside. I gave the metaphor earlier of using a hammer. You use that hammer where it's helpful and where it's not helpful you set it aside. Maybe you need to use a different tool. So logic is like that. And I would say in this case the tool of logic that's being used by Jay is not a helpful tool in the context of gaining enlightenment. Next question from Arun, who lives in Bangalore. I'm so used to Bangalore, so anyway, <laughs> Bangalore, all right, in Karnataka state. And uh, Arun asks, if the human birth is considered to be the highest, and there are many scriptural statements, they say that, that you can be born in so many different yonis, they say. You can have so many different kinds of births from a worm, from a cockroach, and up. And by the way, they didn't even know about microbes. <laughs> microbes are living beings. So their number would have had to be much higher <laughs> had they known about microbes. So you could have so many different births, and they say to be born as a human being is the highest. Of course, you can argue about to be born as a deva in some kind of heavenly realm is even better, but the difference is to be born as a deva in a heavenly realm, you don't have free will. You don't have free will. You just enjoy. It's just a blissful life experience. All your, you don't have any desires. You don't, you don't need to do anything. You don't do anything. There's no free will. According to the doctrine of karma, heaven and hell are conditions of experience and not karma. You don't commit new karmas in heavenly or hellish domains. So there's no karma committed. They're just pure experience, pure blissful experience in a heavenly domain, pure suffering in a hellish domain. So the human birth is considered highest. You have free will, the free will that can lead you to gain moksha. Theoretically, I, there are some teachings about krama. I didn't get it. Go off on a huge aside here. Yes, there are some teachings about Krama Mukti. You go to Brahmaloka, you are taught by Brahmaji, become enlightened by Brahmaji. This is a particular doctrine. But in general, heaven is not, in general, you cannot get enlightened if you go to heaven. Huh? In general, setting that particular doctrine aside. Heaven is a time of enjoyment for your accumulated good deeds. And when, those, when that good karma is exhausted, you, what, you play those shoots and ladders games. <laughs> so when your good karma is, is exhausted, zip, <laughs> you come down that uh, chute. Okay, but his question is, human birth for, th for these reasons, human birth, as, as Arun correctly said, is considered the highest, more so than a deva in some heavenly realm. But then, if human birth is, is considered the highest, then how do we understand human beings committing such heinous crimes and the asura qualities of human beings? Without question, human beings are capable of the most horrible behavior. No one can, can argue with that. <coughs> Human beings are also capable of the most generous and self-sacrificing behaviors. Now compare that to other things. Every species of animal it, are cruel. Extremely cruel. I mean, some, 
Some, uh, some animals eat their offspring or abandon their offspring. Some species, after mating, they kill their, their partner. And, you know, there are all kinds of, you know, th you know, if they were human behaviors, they would be off the scale in terms of being disgusting. So don't think that human, that animal behavior is without uh, heinous crimes, harm. So animal behavior is that. And here's here, just interesting. Um, oh, there's a story about that. Let me give, I haven't told this story for decades. Let me, let me get it straight in my mind. The difference between a human being and animals, the, the power of free will. If you, um, if you've invited a guest for dinner, you set the table nicely, and your guests are seated there, and they're hungry, but you say, give me just a minute, I have to go to the kitchen and get something. When you go to the kitchen, do your hungry guests begin eating? <laughs> no, they wait for you to come back, right? So, now imagine you give a hungry, you have a pet dog, you give that dog some, a bowl of food, and you say, wait a minute, I'm going to the <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> and even though your dog might understand something about, wait a minute, as soon as you're gone, that dog is eating, eating the food. This delayed gratification, this is studied in psychology, Delayed gratification is something animals don't seem to be capable of, and delayed gratification is symbolic of setting your own needs aside for the sake of others. To me, that's a uniquely human trait. Animals may be capable of giving love without question. Yeah, pets, you know, pets seem to be very, very loving. But this idea of selfless giving seems to be unique to, to human beings. We'll take one more question here. This is from Raja Gopalan, who, my questions stem from the ideas of U.G. Krishnamurti. Now, please don't conf confuse Krishnamurti with that Krishnamurti. J. Krishnamurti is well known in, in for, for most Hindus. And, of course, that's a very complicated story, the, the story of J. Krishnamurti as a spiritual teacher and his involvement with Theosophical Society. It's a whole big thing. We won't go there. But U. G. Krishnamurti is a very different personage who he had, he's no more, but he had the most unique teaching. He called himself a spiritual teacher, and if you went to him for spiritual instruction, he'd say, why are you here? Go away. <laughs> there's no moksha, there's no such thing as spiritual growth. Forget it. Have a beer. I don't know if he drank alcohol, I have no, <laughs> no idea, but, but he was actually anti-spirituality, and somehow, he was a spiritual teacher. I don't exactly <laughs> understand <laughs> how that worked, but he would express his spiritual ideas through anti-spiritual concepts. He would criticize and criticize everything, and that's perhaps one place where J. J. Krishnamurti and uh, U. G. Krishnamurti had something in common. They were both highly critical. And their teachings were, were largely one of criticizing this, criticizing that, criticizing the other thing. And perhaps there's some value in that criticism, but if it's only criticism, if it's unending criticism, if it's unrealistic criticism, uh, where did I lost, lost, where is it? This one. Uh, how does Advaita refute these statements, the statements that, uh, that Raja Gopalan attributes to, uh, to U.G. Krishnamurti? The human body is all there is. Advaita consciousness and enlightenment are like mirages. And these, these statements would be absolutely consistent 
with what U.G. Krishnamurti used to teach. Just there's no such. It, you know, it's like the ancient Charvaka philosophy. Your body is all there is, so you better enjoy your life as much as you can because after you're dead, that's it. Well, that is completely against the teachings of the ancient rishis, against the teachings of Advaita Vedanta. So I don't think U.G. Krishnamurti, as I said, some value in criticism, it, make, it kind of wakes us up. We get, um, sometimes we get complacent about things. Oh, yes, I know that, yes, I know that, yes, I know that. So critical thinking is really crucial. But I never met him, but I've watched more than a few of his videos, and I understand how he taught and thought. And, you know, I'm going to make a very odd uh, comparison. Today, there are some news channels and news presenters who are who come to fame for making absurd claims they are famous for making these absurd claims and the more absurd the claims are the more famous they become <laughs> it's a certain approach if you want to be well known you can either be really, really good at what you do, or you can be really controversial. And we see that a lot in media today. People who want to be well-known, and to be well-known, they behave and they say extremely controversial things, absurd things. To me, U.G. Krishnamurti seems to fall in that, in that realm, that he was deliberately controversial, and that was his claim to fame. Anyway, that's my interpretation. You don't have to agree with me. That's my, my opinion. So we have more questions here? One question here. You'll need the microphone, please. Uh, Swamiji, my question is related to the understanding of consciousness that you covered today. So I understand consciousness is immediately present here and now as the knownness of this experience, but consciousness as the knownness of a boundaryless, uncreated reality um, does that require m me to be an advanced spiritual student? How do, it's easier for me to mm -hmm. uh, uh, look at consciousness um, as the knownness of this experience. Mm -hmm. But if I want to go into a further mm -hmm. um, understanding of consciousness as that boundaryless, uncreated, infinite mm -hmm. reality, mm -hmm. do I have to step up? Mm. Or is that... Let, let's rephrase your question. How can I know? It's not difficult to appreciate consciousness as the knownness of this experience we're having right now. Consciousness is here, now, in your experience as the knownness of the experience. But then the ancient rishis said much more about consciousness. They said that that consciousness is unborn, uncreated, limitless, vast, um, utterly unaffected by everything. How to know that? That's what all these teachings are about. <laughs> and the teachings work mostly, we are talking about criticism before, let's use the term negation. So how to know that your consciousness is unborn comes through negating any possibility of birth. Let me make this point clear. Um, a little abstract. Let me, <laughs> let, me tr let me try to make it not so abstract. In order to say consciousness is subject to birth, you have to show me how. 
demonstrate to me, explain to me, prove to me how consciousness originates. By, and this is the way Vedanta works, Vedanta can't prove anything about consciousness. Vedanta cannot prove that consciousness is unborn, uncreated, limitless, and vast, etc., etc., etc. What Vedanta does is disprove any argument to the contrary. So if you have any kind of theory about the origin of consciousness, bring it up. <laughs> In one of our sessions, there's plenty of Vedanta available to dismiss that wrong conclusion. So, Vedanta then can be understood in this way. That consciousness is your true nature, is self-evident. Who are you? You are a conscious being. That consciousness is immediately present as the knownness of this experience. It takes a little bit more effort, but you get, as you said, you get, the, you get that part. Um, but then, your question, how to know that that consciousness is unborn, uncreated, etc., etc. That's what we do in every class. And we do so by bringing up arguments to the contrary and dismissing them. And over a period of time, all of those arguments eventually get dismissed, then what are you left with? Unborn, uncreated, limitless consciousness, which is your essential nature. You have a follow-up for that? No. Okay, good. Another question here? Right here. Microphone, please. So um, I kind of confused myself. Um, during the singularity, right, was there a consciousness in, um, there or like and was there any knowingness going on during the singularity or knownness is a human term right okay yeah. so we're talking in terms of ex your experience right. so if you're talking about singularity you're talking about philosophy and science so we have to use a whole different approach a whole different uh vocabulary so if you're going to talk about science and we we talk about science but we're not talking about science right. We're not talking about philosophy, we're talking about your experience. And part of your, and in your experience, is knownness. So, we can't, if we're going to talk about your experience, we talk about knownness. If we're going to talk about the, uh, the Big Bang or singularity, then we're not talking about your experience. Did any of you experience the Big Bang? <laughs> You know, consciousness was present without question, but you and I as individuals were not available at the time to experience that. Any follow-up? Okay. One more question here in back. So, Michi Namaskar. So, I had a question, very generic question, like why is it that some people who are very religious, like who do pujas, go to temple often, who do say shlokams, so why are they not inclined towards understanding and learning about our scriptures? Mm -hmm. So all they do is just pujas and everything, but they don't seem to understand scriptures. And why is that? That's a, a very good question. <coughs> and certainly we see, especially in traditional Hindu culture, we see many people who are um, really focused on the performance of rituals. Why? Not hard to <laughs> understand why, because, uh, and by the way, usually it's a female, a woman, <laughs> who, who is really focused. And this is, I'm talking about now conventional, traditional Hindu culture, in which um, the, the, the mother of the home is sometimes really focused on on doing all these rituals, her husband may or may not <laughs> be involved in some kind of spiritual study. And if he is, and she says, and he says to her, why don't you try studying the scripture? And she may say, why should I study the scripture? I just want to go on doing my rituals. Very common uh, uh, scenario in many uh, traditional Hindu households. And if you ask why, you don't have to dig very far to find out that 
her mother was very focused on rituals, and her mother <laughs> was very focused on rituals. So there's a family tradition. We learn from our parents. Our same-sex parents become role models. So if you're female, you're likely to model your behavior on your mother's behavior. So if your mother was very inclined towards, towards rituals, then she becomes very uh, focused on rituals. And if you say, why is there no interest in the study of scriptures? Again, did her mother study scripture? Or her <laughs> mother study of scripture? This is a very common scenario wherein we become really molded by culture. And maybe that's one of the good things. You know, there, there are people who argue that, oh, we're losing the old traditions, we're losing the old culture, and things will never be the same as the good old days. And there are a lot of people who feel that way, a lot of people who feel the other way. <laughs> and that is, the good old days were maybe not that good, and were very restrictive in many ways and very narrowly focused in s many ways and not very helpful in many ways. No doubt there's a great value in the strength of a society and family that comes through traditional culture. So I'm not blasting traditional culture, but I'm, everything is complex. If traditional culture, is it good or bad? And the answer is yes. There are some extremely positive aspects of these <coughs> traditional cultures. Holds families together, gives a very strong basis for morality, etc. But there's a downside too. And I think what you're expressing is a downside of that tradition where you become very confined, in a manner of speaking, by, uh, by culture. And that's the... That, you know, what did they say? Two sides of every coin. That would be uh, a way of explaining it. Any follow up on that? Okay. Let's take a couple of questions online. This is a question from Melissa, who lives in France. Nice to have uh, uh, students all over. Um, Melissa asks um, Does the law of karma apply to animals? And she observes that some animals are born into such horrendous lives, like animals in a laboratory where they are lab subjects, where they are subjected to all kinds of tests. And then, of course, after those tests, of course, then they have to be killed so that you can analyze the effect of all of those tests. Most of the tests, you can't find out if the test was successful or not until you chop up the animal <laughs> and find out. <coughs> um, also, uh, animals are subjected to uh, horror. In zoos, can you imagine? There, there are some uh, these great apes that live out their lives in a zoo, 50 years living in a zoo, elephants. You know, we're talking about highly intelligent animals confined to a zoo. How about fur farms? Animals raised, can you imagine? Animals raised just for their fur. That's it. Um, and all of this at the hand of humans. Where is the justice? And what is the purpose of all this? So, are, are animals subject to the laws of karma? Yeah. Just as human beings are, we are born with good and bad karmas. The, the good karmas lead to wonderful experiences in our lives. The not-so-good karmas lead to suffering. Animals are born with the same thing. We're also born with a combination of good and bad karmas. Wouldn't it be the same for animals? How about an animal who is born and ends up being the beloved pet of a wealthy family that dotes on this, on this animal? They got everything. Just one... You know, that's probably better than your life and my life. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, there's you have to do something to get your food. The animal does, the animal goes meow and the food <laughs> and the food just appears. 
So, so those are examples of animals that are born as re all beings are born as a result of past karmas. So animals which have lots of good karmas are animals like that. But I think we'd have to acknowledge that most animals are not born into such circumstances. They're born, you know, think about, you know, in this country, dogs are such beloved pets. Think about dogs on the street in India. What a life. I mean, pretty, you know, just, they're always fighting, hungry, etc., etc. It's, uh, it's a dog's <laughs> life. <laughs> anyway. anyway, but not the pet dog life. So there, every animal, like human beings, are subject to such a wide range of experiences. What is, it, what is the experience of an ant or a cockroach or an animal in a laboratory or whatever it is? So, it's, yes, animals are subject to laws of karma with one important exception. Actually, I won't say an exception. One feature about the laws of, uh, about the doctrine of karma that you might not think about Human beings are born with free will, and because we have free will, we can do, we can create new karma, called agami karma. So even if we're born with lots of bad karmas, which make us suffer, we can do something about it. Right? We have free will. Can we, can we completely overcome it? Probably not but we're not totally helpless either. Animals, on the other hand, don't have free will. They do have instincts. So if, if one animal is attacked by another, it will defend itself. It'll bark and bite and all of this stuff. But if the other animal is bigger and stronger, then there's no hope. So animals have instincts. Animals can do something to take care of themselves but animals have no free will. They can't improve their, their quality of life through doing good deeds. Okay, one more question here. This is a question from Amit. Amit lives in India. He says, do the terms moksha and mukti mean the same thing? Yes, they're derived from the same root, much, which means to be free. So moksha and mukti both mean freedom. But in understanding these terms properly, we have to add freedom from what? <laughs> so moksha and mukti mean freedom, but unless we say freedom from what, you know, how about freedom from taxation? That was a big <laughs> <laughs> that was a big thing in America during when it was ruled by the Brits. They wanted freedom from this unfair taxation, and that led to the American Revolutionary War. Obviously, we're not talking about freedom from unfair taxation here. We are talking about two different kinds of freedom, however. The conventional wisdom about mukti and moksha, it's freedom from rebirth. And the reason freedom from rebirth is, a, is important is every time you get born, unless you're born in heaven, every time you're born, you get born with some good karmas and some bad karmas. Those bad karmas lead to suffering. And even if you're born in heaven, after you use up your good karma, then you get born again into a life of suffering. Rebirth necessarily entails suffering. For that reason alone, rebirth is undesirable. If you could be reborn as that dog in that wealthy family, <laughs> or if you can be reborn and stay in heaven forever, go for it. But that's not the way the doctrine of karma works. According to the doctrine of karma, rebirth necessarily leads to suffering. So therefore, one kind of moksha is called videha mukti, the freedom that you have following death, videha, when your body falls. But there's another kind of mukti that we focus on mostly in Advaita Vedanta called jivan mukti. It's a kind of freedom that you enjoy 
while you're alive, and in particular, freedom from suffering. So moksha, mukti, mean the same thing, freedom. The, more, the most general then definition is freedom from suffering, not freedom from rebirth, freedom from suffering, both in this life and after this life. So, um, and uh, there's a second part to Ahmed's question. If there are no desires at the time of death, then the soul does not take rebirth. Huh? I don't think that's what's taught. <laughs> so if you are content when you die, actually this is a common misinterpretation. Um, there are scriptural statements that say that the Situation at the end of your life determines what comes next, but these statements are often taken out of context. I don't think we want to get into a big long discussion here. We're going to wrap up our satsang in just a few moments. Um, you've become free from rebirth. How? If freedom from rebirth means being perfectly content at the end of your life, depending on what you mean content, B suppose someone misinterprets it, you should be blissful at the end of your life. If you are blissful at the end of your life, then you won't be reborn. It says free from desires. So let's replace free from desires with blissful. One who is blissful at the end of his life. Well. Sri Ramakrishna, Ramana Maharshi, and many other saints died in agonizing pain. They weren't blissful. I guarantee you, they were in agonizing pain. But being enlightened, they won't get reborn. So my point is, freedom from rebirth is not due to how you die. Freedom... Uh, the, the counter example would be you give anyone enough morphine, they're going to be <laughs> absolutely blissful when they pass away, and that's what better way to go <laughs> than from, from that morphine haze into eternity. That's good. Freedom from rebirth is gained, according to the ancient rishis, through these teachings of Vedanta, which lead you to discover your own true nature as Satchitananda Atma, utterly non-separate from Brahman. And the reason you're not reborn is you become freed. Another way of saying another kind of freedom. You become freed from the effects of your past karmas. So for most people, past karmas will keep you getting reborn again and again and again. According to the doctrine of karma, you have had an infinite number of prior lives in which you've accumulated an infinite number of karmas, which will keep you going for how long? <laughs> an infinite number of future births. <coughs> so the way, what is the way out? The way out is not to get rid of those karmas one by one by one by one. How long will that take? Got it. <laughs> so the way is to utterly destroy your connection to all of those karmas. And the scriptures will use language like you burn all together. All of those accumulated karmas are figuratively speaking burnt by jnana agni, the fire of spiritual knowledge. When the fire of spiritual knowledge burns away, not really burning the karmas, but burning your ownership or connection to all of those karmas, you are then completely free from the effect of those karmas, which means after you die, you are, you remain Non separate from Brahman with zero impediments. I'll just end with this observation. Our bodies and minds are wonderful blessings, but not always. <laughs> Sometimes they become impediments to peace.
and contentment due to illness and other other things when one is bodiless and mindless mind not mindless in a in a casual way but but free from this human form then one remains non-separate from brahman with zero possibility of any kind of impediment this is uh, G, this is Videha Mukti. This is the ultimate liberation. And this would be a good place to conclude. Thank you for your questions, both from those of you here and those of you online. You can submit your questions, send them to me by email, and we'll do our best to take them up in uh, next class. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchadduha Bhagavet Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityor Ma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om. That's it. See you next time.